Thank you very much. I'm sorry to keep you waiting until the slides showed up, but the story that I'm going to tell this afternoon is very much a story in graphs, because I think that's the best way to understand the long-term trajectory of hu human freedom. What are the prospects for hum human freedom? Well, it very much depends on the time scale. Over the short term, the last five to 10 years, the story is mildly discouraging. Here is a graph from Freedom House that shows the percentage of regimes that are democratic. Uh, and as you can see, there has been a leveling off and a very slight decline over the last decade or so. Their measure of the global average freedom score, uh, both of political liberties and of civil liberties, also shows a very slight decline. But over the long term, I think there are grounds for optimism. And to preview what I'm going to say this afternoon, I'm going to show you that the long-term global historical trend is very much in the direction of greater freedom, that we should expect the struggle for freedom to be an uphill cl climb because human rights is an unnatural concept. Nonetheless, the historical forces are pushing in the right direction. So how do we d discern the long-term historical trends? Well, first of all, we have to know what the starting point was. What were the first governments like? And Archaeologists and historians tell us they were extraordinarily unfree. That basically all the first centralized governments were led by despots. These were men who could impose their will on their uh, countries, who could kill with impunity, and who kept large harems of women. All of the first civilizations practiced human sacrifice, killing innocent people to propitiate angry gods, like the stereotype of throwing the virgin into the volcano uh, to get better, better weather or success on the battlefield. All the first civilizations practiced slavery. All of them criminalized sacrilege, disloyalty, witchcraft, and sexual deviance, and all of them punished these deviants and dissidents by torture, mutilation, and execution. So that was our starting point. However, government violence has declined dramatically at two major historical moments. The first was the humanitarian revolution during the European Enlightenment of the 18th century. So just a reminder of how the um, criminal justice and uh, other forms of um, oppression of dissent were managed in prior to the 18th century. Here are a few illustrations from Europe in the Middle Ages. Uh, miscreants were punished by uh, breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, clawing with iron hooks, sawing in half, uh, and impalement, among other uh, ingenious forms of torture and execution. But in a process that began in the 18th century, country after country abolished the use of torture as a form of criminal punishment. The United States has its famous Eighth Amendment to the Constitution prohibiting cruel and, and unusual punishment, but this occurred in the middle of a worldwide phenomenon of abolishing cruel and unusual punishments. Also abolished during this period was the profligate use of the death penalty for non-lethal crimes. In 18th century England, there were 222 capital offenses on the books, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, and, quote, strong evidence of malice in a child 7 to 14 years of age. By 1861, the number of capital crimes had been reduced to four. Likewise, in the United States in the 17th and 18th centuries, the death penalty was used for theft, sodomy, bestiality, adultery, witchcraft, concealing birth, slave revolt, and counterfeiting. This graph shows that in colonial times, a majority of the executions were for crimes other than murder. By the time we reached the 21st century, the only crime punished by death other than murder was conspiracy to commit murder. Also abolished during the humanitarian revolution were witch hunts, religious persecution such as burning heretics, debtors' prisons, and most famously of all, slavery. Now, slavery used to be legal everywhere on earth. No one seemed to think there was anything wrong with it. The Bible had no problem with slavery. So-called democratic Athens was a slave-holding society. But beginning in the uh, second half of the 18th century, there was a trickle of abolitions that swelled into a, a wave that eventually encompassed the entire earth, culminating in 1980 when Mauritania became the last country on earth to abolish legal slavery. The second reduction of government violence took place more re uh, recently in a a process I call the rights revolutions. Perhaps its symbolic onset was the passage of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. 
the rights revolution saw increased protection of individuals against arbitrary government power. In particular, the power of governments to kill its citizens en masse, execute them, force them into military servitude, oppress them on the basis of race or ethnicity, ethnicity and criminalize consensual behavior. And I will show you graphs uh, depicting the reduction of each one. Now, the story of genocide in the 20th century is, uh, to put it mildly, not a happy one. But after the peak in the 1940s of the Nazi, Soviet, and Japanese genocides, the trajectory has been bumpy with some uh, horrific spikes, but unmistakably downward. The death penalty uh, in Europe has been uh, virtually completely eliminated. This timeline from 1775 to the present shows the number of European countries with capital punishment, which has pretty much fallen off a cliff. More interestingly, the blue line shows the number of European countries that actually carry out executions, which indicates that well before politicians had gotten around to uh, striking capital punishment from the law books, their citizens had lost their taste for putting people to death. And on average, 50 years elapsed between the time that capital punishment was formally abolished and the time of the last actual execution. Now, the United States is a notorious exception to this trend so far because it is a Western democracy that still executes people. But even in the United States, if you look at the number of states that have the death penalty, the trend has been steadily downward, and it has accelerated in the last few years. There have been uh, three more abolitions just in the last five years, and several other states that have a long-term moratorium on the death penalty. This is indeed a worldwide trend. This uh, graph is the inverse of the preceding two. It shows the number of countries uh, without the death penalty, that is the number that have abolished the death penalty for all crimes. The trend since 2001 is uh, upward for abolitions, downward for uh, executions. If current trends were to continue, then the death penalty would be abolished from the face of the earth by 2026. Countries are forcing fewer of their citizens into um, military, involuntary military service and for uh, shorter periods of time. This graph shows 48 major nations and the length of time their citizens have been uh, conscripted from 1970 to the present. Uh, this graph shows the number of countries with uh, laws on the books that discriminate against ethnic minorities, apartheid or Jim Crow laws, and that has been in steady decline. The blue line shows countries that have done the opposite, that have bent over backwards to pass affirmative action or remedial discrimination policies that attempt to give a boost to their disadvantaged minorities. We're living in a period in history unique in having more countries that try to help their disadvantaged minorities than that discriminate against them. The, uh, despite some notable setbacks, the worldwide trend is to decriminalize homosexuality. Here we have the trend for the number of American states that have decriminalized homosexuality, which now stands at 100%. And here we have the trend for nation states worldwide. Uh, well, what about the slowdown of democratization that I mentioned at the outset? Even that has to be taken in historical perspective. I showed you a graph that began in 1989. If we zoom out, and if I show you the graph going back to 1946 from the Center for Systematic Peace, you can see that starting in 1975, there was a massive decline in the number of uh, autocracies and a steady increase in the number of uh, democracies. The number of anocracies, that is countries that are neither fully democratic nor fully uh, autocratic, seems to be uh, more or less um, stable, but the long-term trend for democracies is on the increase. This statement from Matt Ridley is definitely an exaggeration, uh, but it is not that far from the truth. When he wrote recently, when I was young, only a few countries were democracies, the rest were run by communist or fascist despots. Today, there's only a handful of the creeps left. They could all meet in a pub. Fat Kim, Castro the brother, Mugabe, a couple of Central Asians, the blokes from Venezuela and Bolivia, the Belarusian geezer. Putin's applying for membership. The Chinese one no longer shows up. Well, why did it take so long? And why is it still so hard? What is so uh, difficult about the concept of human rights and uh, freedom? Uh, in fact, it is not such an obvious concept for two reasons. One is that humanity always faces a trade-off between freedom and security. Which is worse, having too little government and uh, being in a state of anarchy, 
or too much government and being in a state of tyranny? It's not obvious what the answer to that question is, and I only know one long-term historian who's tried to answer it. This is a man who calls himself an atrocitologist, Matthew White, and he has attempted to measure the death toll from the worst atrocities and bloodbaths over 2,500 years of human history. And his overall conclusion is that chaos is deadlier than tyranny. More of the top 100 mass killings result from the breakdown of authority rather than the exercise of authority which means that people are always tempted to sacrifice freedom for security, and that some form of minimally competent government may be a prerequisite to a concern with freedom. One can think of democracy as a kind of uh, optimum middle ground, uh, as a complicated gadget designed to avoid the extremes of anarchy and tyranny, and that a government that's given just enough power to protect citizens uh, from preying on each other without the government itself preying on its citizens. And it's not surprising that it takes a long historical process to perfect this gadget. Also, the human moral sense, counterintuitively, does not find human rights and human freedom all that natural a concept. What do human beings consider to be moral and immoral? Well, we might say in the modern West that morality consists of maximizing freedom, that is autonomy, and maximizing happiness, that is uh, flourishing. As is captured by the common saying that if it's done between consenting adults and doesn't harm anyone else, it's morally okay. However, we have to realize that this is a modern and not so natural conception of morality. Anthropologists have shown that across the world's societies, and even within our own societies, there are many other spheres of human conduct that people deem worthy of moralization. Tribalism, loyalty to the group. Authority, deference to legitimate hierarchy. Conformity, adhering to social norms. And purity, avoiding contamination and licentiousness. Traditionally, people want to punish or have the government pub punish for them these transgressions. And one can think of enlightenment and classical liberalism as a reduction of the traditional human moral concerns, away from tribalism, authoritarianism, conformity, and puritanism, uh, that is, forms of moral intuitions which cannot be justified by reason, to just autonomy and flourishing, which are forms of moralization which can be justified by reason. Well, the final question I'll raise is, what drives this process? What drives enlightenment? And another way of posing the question is, which historical developments tend to precede the expansion of human rights? And a recurring answer is that it's technologies and practices that encourage reason and cosmopolitanism, the mixing of people and ideas, uh, such as printing and other media, literacy, education, and public discourse. In particular, can historians point to anything that happened prior to the European Enlightenment that might explain why it happened then as opposed to 200 years earlier? Uh, the best answer that I can find uh, comes from these two graphs. This shows the number of books published per decade, and in the century prior to the 18th century, you see an exponential number of books published per decade, a kind of early version of Moore's Law. Uh, and it was during this period uh, the 18th century, that for the first time in history, literacy rate passed the 50% mark, so people could actually read those books. Similarly, what happened in the late 20th and early 21st century that has pushed the uh, process toward rights and, and uh, democratization? Well, this was the era of the electronic global village, of television, satellites, long-distance telephones, the expansion of education, the World Wide Web, and most recently, social media. Well, why should literacy, communication, and education matter? Well, they encourage people to think more abstractly and more universally, to interrogate their own moral convictions and ask which ones can be justified, to encourage people to analyze social and political arrangements as human inventions that can be improved rather than the way things always have been and always must be. And I'll, again, I will give you some evidence from uh, a couple of graphs. One is that, as astonishing as it may seem, we've been getting smarter. Uh, that abstract reasoning abilities, as measured by IQ or other tests, have been steadily increasing. The so-called Flynn effect, IQ scores have increased by an average of three points per decade uh, throughout the 20th century, and uh, a worldwide process. 
Other studies have shown that people in societies that have enjoyed higher levels of education and higher levels of measure, measured intelligence have more classically liberal attitudes, that is, opposition to racism, sexism, and xenophobia, and are more receptive to democracy 10 years down the line, holding all other factors constant. So to sum up, I've uh, given some reason to think that human freedom is temporarily stagnating, but there are reasons to be optimistic over the long term. That the long-term historical trend is massively in the direction of increases in human freedom and rights, that human rights has always been an uphill climb because people are all too willing to trade freedom for security, and the human moral se sense is obsessed not just with autonomy and flourishing, but also with tribalism, authority, conformity, and purity. Finally, modernity is increasing the forces that tend historically to push human rights along, communications, education, uh, and reason. If history is a guide, these trends militate toward a long-term expansion of freedom and rights, and it is conceivable that one day autocracies will go the way of human sacrifice, debtors' prisons, and slave auctions. Thank you very much. Thank you.